Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, the beef producer's place to explore new management practices. Thanks for tuning in, and welcome to the community. Hey folks, thanks for tuning in again, and if you are new here, welcome to the show. This episode is going to be a great one for anyone who wants to learn more about the value of agent source verification when selling calves, along with how to start finding direction in your own cow herd to find marketing programs that work for you. In general, it's a great episode that shares the story of how one family continues to produce calves that feedlots want, generation after generation. Today we are visiting with Fred Otley and Rachel Oliver. Fred and his wife Debbie raised commercial crossbred cattle in Oregon and set a great example of how to establish a crossbreeding program that creates cows that work for their environment and calves that feeders want. Fred and Debbie are both working on the ranch day to day along with their other family members, who Fred will talk about later in the episode. It's truly a team effort for the Otley family. Rachel Oliver will be joining the conversation to discuss the more technical side of the Otley Brothers marketing program. Agent source verification through the Red Angus Association's Allied Access Program is a key factor that has allowed Otleys to create a marketing program that is successful for them. Remember to rate and review the show in your favorite podcast app and share your thoughts and follow-up questions with me. With that, let's visit with Fred and Rachel. I'm going to have Rachel and Fred introduce themselves. Um, Rachel, how about you go first, since we're mostly going to be visiting with Fred today and about um, their operation. So if you could just talk a little bit about who you are, where you're located, and what you're doing in the beef industry, that would be great. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Shay. Um, Like Shay said, my name is Rachel Oliver. I'm a commercial marketing specialist with the Red Angus Association. Um, Actually, today is my third year anniversary working for Red Angus, so it's kind of neat that I get to do this interview, and uh, it is my three-year anniversary. Um, And I am located over in Savage, Montana, so for many that have never heard of that town, uh, it is a very tiny town in eastern Montana, located right on the North Dakota border. Um, And so I travel across the country um, as a commercial marketing specialist. Uh, We've split off into regions just recently. And so my regions that I cover for my job um, is Montana, North Dakota, and then a little bit of South Dakota, and then all the way to the West Coast. So a lot of area to cover, but a lot of gray Red Angus cattle that I get to see um, and even better producers. And then um, part of my job is just helping uh, producers market their calves or, you know, a lot of times, like especially for Otley's, um, they don't really need a lot of advice on how to market their cattle properly. Um, But I get to visit with them and I get to bounce ideas off of them if they have questions for me. um, I am happy to answer them. Um, I actually was out to their uh, ranch last year. Um, back in, I think it was May, and got to visit with Fred and Sherry um, and get to see their operation in person, get to see the cattle, um, and just get to see what Diamond Oregon was like. Um, So that's just a little bit about myself and what I get to do on a daily basis. Well, we're happy to have you on the show. Now, Fred, do you kind of want to introduce yourself a little bit and just start with kind of maybe who you are and what's your role on your cattle operation today yes i'm uh i'm from a family ranch it's, we've got pretty deep roots in the cattle industry going back to basically 1886 and uh i'm kind of president of our family corporation uh and we raise sim angus commercial cattle and work closely with the red angus association and it's been a big uh, benefit to our operation. So you do have very much a a rich history and a deep, deep roots in the beef industry. But today, before we dive into that, you said you're president of your family corporation. How many family members are active on the operation today? Well, mom and dad uh, died in the last few years. So it's uh, us kids. I have a sister that's with her husband Doug Stott uh, on the ranch uh, working full-time and then uh, my brother comes over he's part of the family corporation and he helps out on projects and and does different jobs when he can get away from his home 
which is a few hours away. And then we have uh, kids and grandkids that come and help uh, part time all the time away from their jobs. Well, awesome. So you said um, the 1800s is kind of when you go back to. So how many generations deep does well, the operation go? Great grandfather was Fred Otley, and it, it, it actually is a different location than we're presently at. But he came in 1886 from Southern California after his wife died from tuberculosis. And he has a daily diary for 30, 40 years, so that's pretty fun. Um, he, we, he, that was in 1886, and when it got flooded for seven in 1986, 100 years, then we were kind of forced to sell it because it was, uh, you know, three three cow days, three 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 days of cattle drive to get our cattle back and forth. So um, there was going to be a lot of uh, repair and and reconstruction to ever get the original homestead area in back into shape. So we were kind of, you know, we had to focus on where we we're at and had to sell it, which was pretty hard on our family, a hundred years after great grandfather settled there. So where are you located now and kind of what does that environment look like for your cattle? We we're about sixty miles south of Burns, Oregon, in southeastern Oregon, high desert area with dry mountain ranges and it's about a hundred miles, probably 85 to hundred miles as a, as a crow flies from the, the Nevada border. So you're pretty in a fairly arid climate then if you're high desert or what does that look like? Yeah, there's, there's some, uh, the mountain ranges are few and far between, but we, part of our ranch is by high desert and part of it, uh, runs up Steens Mountain, and we run up to oh, moderately high, <clears throat> high uh, elevations, seventy, eight hundred feet, and uh, it's we're long and narrow, extremely rocky, dry ridges, and a lot of creek bottom. Um, so there's our cattle have to adapt to all sorts of different environments uh, during the breeding and growing phase up to the when. And, and during the winter uh, for a 12-month cycle uh, before before we ship our calves. We have retained ownership in the past, but uh, now we pretty much sell wing calves. Okay, so tell me a little bit more about the, like, when are you, when's your calving period on your ranch? Um, are you just a, you just raised the commercial? You're just a commercial cow calf operation. Yes, uh, we start calving really late February, kind of first of March. Target it does change a little bit over time, depending on the the weather conditions early in the year. Because uh, when our when our cattle start up the mountain, it's it's really tough on cows and bulls. It's really rocky, and uh, if you have a wet wet year. You try not to go up the mountain too early because it's tough, tough on the cattle, and so in a way, wet years are harder on our outfit than dry years because it gets so muddy uh, on some of those ridges. They kind of go into their hawk, and it's really tough on on cattle at times. But no different than any other ranch. That every ranch has its strengths and weaknesses. So in that, we have really good forage. Uh, you know, in August and September. So it's uh, it's just a mixture like everybody's out operation. So you have to adapt management and you have to have cattle that have the ability through management and the genetics to adapt to those different environments. Yeah, it sounds like you have an environment where adaptability is really important with what you have going on. So with that, why, you, you know, you said Sim Angus, talk a little bit more about the genetics that are on your operation. 
Well, uh, we we went to Red Angus in the, <clears throat> about about 1990. Uh, we went we went to them because of the balance of uh, genetic attributes that we felt would operate the best on our base herd. And um, so that was a good decision to make. And then to re to get a little bit of hybrid vigor, then we moved to Simangus, which has been a, a real benefit also. And part of it is the you know, integrity of the Red Angus <laughs> breeders we work with and the Red Angus Association generally, um, they, they, they were uh, really interested in understanding and utilize, helping us to get to a composite bull that was predominantly Red Angus that would help meet our goals and objectives, both on the cattle production end in terms of fertility and grazing, uh, but also our real interest in meeting the the carcass and growth uh, needs of the feedlots that w would be the next step, backgrounding and feedlots for our cattle, and of course, the carcass attributes uh, at, at processing. So I do want to talk more about your crossbreeding program in general, but before we dive into that, on the Red Angus side, what's the biggest difference you noticed when you started incorporating Red Angus genetics into your herd? Well, it, interestingly, one of the biggest benefits I, I say would be it really helped our labor. Uh, we don't have a lot of extra labor here, and we were fighting genetic weaknesses in our base herd. And they, they they really rapidly improved as soon as we went with Red Angus. And um, and then we worked with Red Angus and, and particular a number of breeders that helped us keep making progress on those things. I mean, uh, I could tell you stories about uh, some bull selection problems that got us into a a really uh, problem at, at, and it always was a problem on, during calving. Our, we were having to pull way too many calves and uh, it was just costing us money and time. So we weren't able to um, do a balanced job of, of management with the labor we had. So my, I remember one time pulling 68% of, of, uh, calves out of our heifers one year and that's about the time when when uh, dad really said you know agreed that we need to go in a different direction and and red angus uh fit all of all of the things that we felt we wanted to do at that time so you know you already touched on that the heterosis standpoint is important to you for your marketing strategy, how you're selling these calves in the next phase that they go on to, whether that's the background or, or feeder. So what actions are you taking year to year to be really intentional with your crossbreeding program? I'm really curious, you know, what does that look like? You talked about having comp comp running composite bulls. Can you just kind of expand on that a little more? Well, we, we review, you know, the different facets of, of our own production records and repeatedly ask the questions are we making progress in fertility uh and all of those areas that that produce uh efficiently so and then we we uh started taking DNA from all of our heifers that we retain and working with uh, the, our breeders uh, to look at the and track 
our DNA or our, our genetic objectives in terms of the EPDs, uh, not just on our, the front end in terms of our, our cow herd management, but the, you know our growth and our, our ability to grade choice or prime. So uh, we look at the, we, we review the individual bulls we've bought in the past and, and refine sale ones that aren't meeting the, the goals and objectives. And that helps us determine which bulls give us that, that maybe new bloodline or give us the uh, hybrid benefit of those attributes that we're focused on. And I, I think it's really working. I, I'm, I feel that uh, we, we keep making progress that's helping us make progress in the bottom line, our profitability. Um, so that's sort of in a general way what we try to do. That's, I, I was kind of excited to hear you say that you are taking those DNA samples on those heifers because that's something that's been talked about on my podcast a couple of times with different breeders. And so I, it's it just always interests me when I hear of commercial cattlemen continuing to be progressive and take those samples and focus on the genetics of their herd. Now, Fred, we've talked about the history of your operation a little bit. We've talked about kind of how you operate, um, like as far as when you're calving, we've looked at your genetic selection um, and talked about crossbreeding. But I want to talk a little bit more about marketing because as we've, or as you've talked, you know, you've brought up that, you know, that fertility, those maternal traits are important to you, but you really seem very focused on how those calves are going to perform from a carcass standpoint too, and um, making sure that they'll be successful in other segments down the line. And ultimately that the consumer will have a good stake at the end of the day. So can you talk a little bit more about what your marketing program looks like? I think our marketing program starts with our health program. You know, we try to do a balanced, really intensive job of getting those calves ready in terms of health vaccinations. And that for the, whoever ends up buying them, um, we sell most of ours on the superior video auction. So uh, that's sort of the starting point, but we feel that that if we retain and work towards uh, a good yield grade and growth, but we do emphasize trying to grade choice, no matter where the industry goes, it, you can always move in a little bit different direction, but I think that quality choice that our industry has made has been and is really benefiting us right now because consumer demand for America's beef uh, has stayed high during these really economic trying times. So uh, part of that is the industry moved in an arena where the, they're 80 to 85% choice coming out of the feedlot. We're, we're running 95 plus percent choice and, uh, and we've, that got better and better on our, our yield grade. And that's both in terms of the base gen, uh, red Angus genetics, but also the sim Angus. So we've been consistent in that. And I think that consistent, uh, knowing where you want to go, staying consistent to try to get there, but try to refine based on better information, where you want to go is critically important. They do, they sell on the video sale, um, at Winnemucca and they, you know, something that they should be very proud about and that it, they're very unique as a commercial producer is that they really, the programs that they are tactfully in really do help get those cattle into those certain buyers that fit all of what Fred had just mentioned. Um, you know, they've lined up a really great set of programs that they're in um, that make their cattle even more valuable. Um, and so that helps them then get into certain buyer markets um, and really add a lot of value that um, I would say not 
all commercial producers think about, um, but they really were tactful in, you know, which programs they place themselves in. I think that they should be very proud about how, how well they've gotten there. Well, and that's a great point. And thank you for bringing that up, Rachel. So, you know, whether it's Fred or Rachel, either one of you who wants to answer that, I know we've mostly been hearing from Fred so far, but what are those programs that have been beneficial to um, their marketing and, you know, bringing that extra value or capturing that extra value that the gaps have? Well, I'll, I'll, I'd say that we, we have, you know, our, the bloodlines that we have in our calves and, and the, the, where they line up, where those genetics line up in terms of growth and, and the ability to, to great choice. And, and I think, uh, along with the health program and, and, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, so when our rep, who's a great guy, Jim Davis, uh, been in the superior a long time so when he comes to our ranch and puts them on the video they the buyer knows that what what they're advertised as that is what they are that is how they'll perform i, I know rachel probably has more to her perspective on that than that but yeah because you you use the um allied access eid tags too correct correct Okay, Rachel, do you kind of want to talk about what those are? And then Fred will come back to you about why you're using them. So Rachel, can you kind of explain what the Allied Access program is? Yeah, so Allied Access is kind of, I guess I'd say like a sister program to our feeder calf certification program. Um, and so Allied Access is our green tag. Instead of the famous yellow tag, it's a green tag. Um, and it covers age and source. So this program was created back in 2012, um, just because the association and the marketing team specifically saw that producers like Otley's were implementing um, heterosis and trying to find a way to help benefit those producers um, wanting to input crossbreeding systems. And so by creating allied access, that gives them the availability to be agent source. They don't have that um, guaranteed red angus component, but it still is the agent source, which is incredibly important in today's industry. Um, buyers like to see that component as well. Um, and so Otley's have been doing that. Um, they use our combo tag. Um, and so that's a dangle tag alongside an EID as well. Um, they customize it to fit their operation, which, you know, we offer that because every one's operation is very different. And so what you want to see on the tag is completely up to you. Um, and so we try and make that happen to where it's easy and it fits, um, you know, their standards on how they want to see that tag viewed. Um, another thing that really helps them is that since they are agent sourced and they have that EID component, they're able to piggyback onto other programs as well. Um, you know, uh, they're in just going off of what they've been in lately, but having that EID component, they're able to easily get access to IMI global programs, um, which that they are involved with, and then also GAP programs as well. Um, and so having that EID component opens them up to more potential buyers um, to more interest, and then it also allows them to get data back. Um, I know they've just recently, like Fred had mentioned earlier, um, they're collecting their heifer uh, information. And, you know, that's all pulled from EIDs as well. Um, and they're able to individually find those animals, um, you know, pinpoint what things are good, what things are bad, um, and go that way. And buyers do the same thing on the steer calves. It's not just the heifers. Um, some of the programs that Otley's are in through IMI and then through us, they're able to potentially get individual data back um, and get to see a lot more of that because of those capabilities and the programs that they're in and that EID that they're also using. Well, that's great, Rachel. Thank you for kind of diving into more of what the program is and how it's impacted Otley's. Fred, do you have anything else you want to add about 
you know, your experience with the allied access program, why you continue to use it or anything along those lines? Well, it, allied access has been a big help in, in Red Angus with the ability to have the EID and the hanging tag. If we lose an EID, we got the hanging tag and we can uh, retain who that calf is or who that cow is. And that's really important. And then when we recently, we put scales under our processing chute and, and uh, we can immediately have all the performance data in terms of weights and, and, and retain the, the history of, of the, the mother cow and, and, or if it's her, of her production, if she's the one in the chute. So without the allied access and the, and the association with Red Angus and that database, that would that wouldn't be possible, and it 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 would be a limitation in our you know our ability to make decisions on on the changes as we go from year to year. And every time you make a decision, you're kind of looking at a five year framework. So it's been a big benefit. I would say they've been in the program for 14 years. Um, and so that's something to be very proud of. They have basically been through it for the start of it. Um, and so it obviously is helping. It is benefiting their program because if, you know, them being in it for so long, it just justifies, you know, why they're in for it. And so it's definitely been a good program that helps benefit them and, um, hopefully continues to benefit them. So Fred, would you say like one of the main benefits you've received from being in this program is, has it created an added trust with your buyers? I know you had mentioned, you're kind of alluded to that earlier, but is that accurate to say, because it's just providing more information to the people interested in your calves? Yes, that's definitely true. And, you know, the trust back, to the purebred breeders and the breeders that are developing the composite bulls that we're really, really interested in right now. Uh, the integrity of it in terms of the Red Angus Association has been of great benefit. And um, with Sam Angus, I'd say Red Angus is, you know, way ahead of others in terms of working with all parties, other breeds, um, like, Rachel said, IMI and and those sorts of third parties and different uh, commercial operations that we, we are all different and we have different genetics that fit our operation. And being able to get that support from Red Angus Association is really important to where we are, the history of where we, how we got here, but also to, to having a, foundation to work from to where we want to go because we have to review that every year we change the industry changes and uh but what we, we where we think we are can adapt to any of those changes that might come along and that's partly because we consistently uh have uh a, a cow herd that that meets our needs and the feedlot uh, needs in terms of growth and carcass. So uh, we feel like we're in a good position to maneuver uh, as the industry changes and it will change. Where do you find that balance in maneuvering where the industry is going and being consistent with the quality and types of calves and your reputation for what you're growing, especially in an industry where, like you said, like change comes slowly just with, um, cows they can only have one calf a year yes and the mistakes i've seen others make and we've made in the past is the call it the whim of the day uh, something sounds good and you jump on it and then you have a different genetic base in your herd that doesn't work when um, you, you all of a sudden decide well that's not uh, that's not very beneficial to marketing those calves. So 
I, I, it's, it's a caution I give to people, you know, don't, don't change what you're doing too quickly without really knowing where you want to go and, and working towards that. And, and frankly, there's so much information you've got to have help and support and, that's from your breeders and that's from the Red Angus Association, whoever you're working with. So I think it's critical to not change what you're doing totally, but really review it, know what, know what you're doing and the impacts uh, of those genetic selections have uh, as you market. So what advice would you have or what would maybe be like a step one if there is a fellow commercial cow calf producer out there right now who is still trying to find what direction they want to go so that they aren't just hopping on the whim of the day. What advice do you have for them to help find that direction in their operation? Well, you have to kind of take off the bias glasses because everybody's got in their mind what they, what, what they, what they have. You really have to critically look at what you have and, and uh, how those calves are, performing as you as they move up the process uh, the, the production line so and it's really hard uh, one of the hardest things was for us to get uh carcass data back on our calves so we could measure how much progress we've made uh, or are making and and to spot the places where uh where we've made some mistakes and then we have to balance our decision making back to get it genetic package to to uh you know to meet our our goals and objectives so i don't know if i answered your question right but that's uh it, it you 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 really got to look at what you have and then go get help whatever that help might be to to uh move in a direction that's consistent with what you want to do but that you make progress i mean you go most of our uh, ranches neighboring ranches and friends uh they've made great improvements by by doing that and their their uh their calving in the spring is going so much better than it used to and that's because of their bull selection that is because of uh information and and decisions on the the breeder what they're doing so it's a it's an integrated thing that you have to you have to work with people you trust and know, and uh, you have to get better and better information to make sure that you're going in the direction you want to go. I think that's a great answer, Fred. So Rachel, if there's a, specifically if there's any Red Angus producers out there, if they're looking for any help or resources, I mean, is the marketing teams, anyone they can reach out to or what, it, what advice you have for on your end? Yeah, I would say just reach out to anyone on the marketing team um, that maybe is close to your area. Uh, we're all listed on the website, redangus.org, under staff, so you can find all of our team because we are fully staffed now. It's not just me and someone else anymore. Um, and so, yeah, reach out to us. Um, that's what we do on a day-to-day -day is we, you know, we don't tell you one way to do it because there isn't one way to do something. We brainstorm with you and we throw out ideas of, hey, maybe have you thought about this or have you thought about this? Um, and so we're just here to help you brainstorm, um, you know, try and help you find different niche markets that maybe benefit um, your operation and just grow. I mean, that's part of Red Angus. If we want to continue to be a breed association, we have to keep cultivating, you know, helping those youth grow up, start becoming more involved in the association. But also we have to let them remember, you know, where we started, how it began. Um, and so you have to use both things, both information, um, and just help cultivate new ideas and a lot of things from the past have always worked. So maybe use some of that too, but um, yeah, just feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, we're always happy to visit and talk with people. And like I said, just brainstorm ideas on how they can better their operation. All right. Well, as we kind of move towards wrapping up the conversation today, Fred, when you think about the future of the beef industry and the next generation that could even be 
taking over your operation. What are you excited about for this younger generation that can come back and has the opportunity to raise beef cattle? Well, one of the things I would say was having a the Red Angus Association that wants to work with commercial programs, not just uh, straight bred Red Angus programs, but those of us that want to go with a, you know, a crossbreeding type heterosis program is is a great benefit because I got somebody I could call. We do, not just me, uh, but uh, and so you, 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 you have better decision making on an ongoing basis to plan better and uh, know know what what you're going to do and when in terms of bull selection. Um, and I'm excited about uh, that we're refining what what we know on the DNA, DNA side of the bull battery uh, and our heifers and our cow, our mother cows, because um, the, the information base is so large and so beneficial to saying, hey, we don't want to go to that line because it's, it's, it's really not meeting our needs. And so uh, I, I think the next generation is going to have uh, more time to to manage and less problems to deal with in terms of how the cattle are producing because they've had a chance to select genetics that work for them. Awesome. Rachel, what are you excited about when you think about the future of the beef industry? I'm just excited that we are utilizing both what we've learned from the past. And then, like Fred said, we're starting to analyze and actually put into use a lot of this technology. And so I like that we're using a little bit of history and we're starting to follow it. Um, and, you know, definitely the younger generation, like, yes, I know I'm very young, but the generation below me I feel like is taking hold of that aspect way stronger than I would say like the millennial generation. Um, and so that's something very exciting to see because for me, I think the marketing game is gonna change so much and that we're gonna focus on maybe things that are that we hadn't before um, and really change how buyers are gonna start looking at, you know, a group of steers or whatever. Um, so I'm just really excited that we're bringing both the past and the future together to really analyze and make a really great product. All right. Well, thank you both for being on the podcast today. It was great to visit with you. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.